very warm welcome to our first Gibbs Flash Forum, where we're going to be taking some of your time every day between two and around half past two uh, to interview thought leaders uh, with a focus on the COVID pandemic as we face it. I'm sure that you're joining me all in homes. I, I understand we've got about 100 people on this forum today, uh, and uh, we're joined by around another 800 people. Uh, my guest of the of the hour today is the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, he also holds a number of board chairs in South African affiliated organizations. And until, well, starting off this year, he's become the senior fellow and lecturer at Yale's Jackson Institute for Global uh, Affairs. He's also a senior advisor to the Eurasia Group. Colin Coleman, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's good to have you. I'm used to having you face to face and we can sort of um, maintain eye contact in slightly different ways, but I suppose this is the way of the world and we're all yeah. we're all moving on to Zoom. And perhaps before we get into the, the matter of the day, uh, I understand you've taken all of your class teaching online at uh, the Jackson Institute, so you, you're, you're running your course without skipping a beat. Yeah, I'm getting used to it. I suppose the world is adapting and this is the new normal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're learning to compress things. Our normal forums at Gibbs last about an hour and a half. And I've been told by, by Katie Kilpatrick, our wonderful producer, that uh, nobody wants to listen to you for more than 40 minutes. So what I thought we'd do is we're going to ask, um, I'm going to ask you some questions today. Uh, I'm going to invite members of the audience to please post your messages on the Zoom chat. I won't get to them for the first 15, 20 minutes. What would be great is if you can put your name with it, because it, it helps me sort of link people to two questions and just post those questions and we'll be getting to them just now. But Colin, I thought today it might be useful for us to, to explore. I'd like to think a little bit about things from a global perspective, and then I'm going to move into the, the um, South African perspective on the pandemic and of course on the business implications. Uh, it's amazing how quickly time moves. I think you did an interview um, on the 16th of March with Gareth Cliff on Tip Central. And uh, I was listening to it yesterday in preparation for today and just thinking about how, how, things, have really, how things have really shifted. Um, and uh, what fascinated me was in that interview, and I think this was a research coming from the, the Eurasia group that you advised, um, you spoke about three time-based scenarios in terms of, I think you phrased it, I, I may be wrong, getting out of the pandemic. You, you referenced a, a really good, which was sort of end of April, um, and then a July scenario, and then something where there's just no peak in the current year, and we start seeing recurrences, I guess. Um, in those uh, just a little more than two weeks, um, what's shifted in terms of the global perspective around um, the time framing around this pandemic? So um, thanks very much, Nicola, and gr great to have your audience. I believe there's a lot of people listening in, uh, so we look forward to those questions. Uh, but effectively, Eurasia, which is founded by Ian Bremmer, um, you know, his, there's a bit of echo feedback um, coming on, coming through. But his uh, his uh, scenario planning effectively looked at those three scenarios you're talking about. The one thing that's moved is I think April is pretty much off the table as a peaking of the COVID virus pandemic. Uh, I'm talking in, in a global sense. Uh, and actually, on the weekend, there was a Boston Consulting Group um, analysis that was sent around. Uh, I'm sure various people might have got, got to see it, which suggested that basically the pandemic will peak in various countries at various times between June, June and the end of July. And effectively, we'll be through the worst by the beginning of August, which really is supportive of the Eurasia second scenario uh, being the real scenario. And as We've had time pass. There's obviously a lot more data to measure what's going on around the world. And obviously with, you know, over a million infections and around 70,000 deaths throughout the world, it certainly looks like the path of the virus could uh, peak towards the end of July and therefore the, nor the world start to normalize, so to speak, uh, in, in an August type scenario. I, I noticed um, uh, in that research quite a strong focus on the northern hemisphere. I suppose that the wild card may well be that some of the countries, South Africa included, in the southern hemisphere play out differently because it does seem to be seem to be weather linked. This virus, um, this virus doesn't like summer, from what I understand. Um, 
But I suppose, you know, all of us have seen uh, countries uh, evolve and move very rapidly to start looking at public health solutions. And of course, it's a time for the epidemiologists and the public health. But the other side of that coin, and perhaps the side that is going to have longer and more profound implications, is, of course, the economy. And it's been fascinating watching pronouncements around the global economy, you know, go sort of from it will be down um, through, to, through to recession. Um, What's your view? Are we staring down the barrel of a recession, a depression? Comparisons have been made with, uh, you know, the early 1900s. Um, if I, I, somebody said to me, we can't expect people to be tea leaf readers, but uh, your sense of, of where the world is at right now and what, what we see coming ahead economically? Well, I, I must say, I was very fortunate to be part of this Jackson Institute where I've got fellows like uh, Stanley McChrystal, the former general who ran the war, um, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Stephen Roach, the Morgan, former Morgan Stanley economist, is my neighbor opposite me at the Yale Jackson Institute, uh, who is famous for his reading on China and so on. And we have occasional fellow meetings. And one of those meetings, um, Stephen Roach, uh, I think very, very much captured the sense of it for me in describing this. He said, look, I've you know, he had been an economist for over 15 year, 50 years, and he's never seen anything like it. And the only way he can describe the economic impact is an economic stop. This is not a recession or a depression, but a complete stop of the economy. And it has various different forms from what we used to. Uh, and the effects are very dramatic. Uh, obviously, the effects are a dramatic decline in quarter on quarter GDP, but also a dramatic decline effectively on 2020 GDP. So Goldman Sachs, my uh, former home, uh, ba basically put GDP growth at the, in the United States at minus 6.8% for 2020 and for South Africa at minus 4%. And I think it's common cause now that the United States is going to see uh, a drop in uh, employment to an unemployment rate somewhere around 15%. So that, that's an unemployment change from 3.5% to minus to 15%, uh, meaning a 11.5% increment in unemployment, which in 165 million people in the United States means uh, effectively around 17, 18 million people losing their jobs. We've already seen 10 million people claim for unemployment benefits in the last uh, couple of weeks. If you extrapolate that for South Africa and you say, well, we should probably, uh, you know, be somewhat similar on the one hand, uh, you know, our unemployment was extremely high before, but on the other hand, we don't have the fiscal uh, space that the United States has. So let's say that we lose 10% um, of our employment uh, that's 1.65 million people in South Africa, and it feels like a one to two million two million uh, people um, employment loss in South Africa is not unimaginable. So the economic consequences of what is a, in the first instance a health pandemic uh, is, you know, very severe. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 it, it strikes me that you would have something valuable to, to bring to that discussion, though, Colin, um, the role that you've been playing with, yes, and if we think about youth and employment services, I mean, we've had our, our eyes on this unemployment ball for a while, where I think the US has been um, breathing a sigh of relief until recent times around um, very healthy employment numbers. Um, so it's, it's, it's obviously going to shift. I mean, what, what has been interesting is for the first time, I think we have really, really seen uh, the EU coming together, although Italy might, might deny it, but from an economic perspective. But by and large, what has struck me so much is so much of the reporting in the media has been at a national level. And so when we start seeing we, it's we the UK, it's we the US, it's we China, etc. Now, of course, some have, have, have termed us going into a sort of a global era of globalization. And on the other hand, what we're watching is, is fights, I mean, in the US, it's even over a federal level uh, um, to try and get healthcare equipment, et cetera. It goes down to state level. But it makes me, it makes me wonder about the global project and uh, 
you know, have we have we seen for now the end of this global age of globalization? We know that obviously things are going to be slower getting back on track in terms of, and there will be a post um, pandemic phase in terms of things like international travel, etc. But but what's the what do you see as the sort of medium term future for globalization? Yeah, I think it's going to change. Um, you know, irrevocably. I think in many in many ways. I think that. You know, there was a Financial Times article this morning that was circulating, which effectively from the Financial Times was saying that uh, the weaknesses in uh, the global space have been exposed through through the virus and the weaknesses in society have been exposed and effectively calling for public policymakers to be leaning in far he more heavily into public service and public goods and providing effective social welfare health, education, and other um, people services into societies where uh, inequality has grown, you know, particularly in the West. Um, and that's remarkable coming from the Financial Times, because they're a sort of mainstream uh, establishment economic paper. So I think the, the fact is that the way people think about what is good for society is going to change very significantly. At the same time, you know, it's very clear for example, the motor manufacturers, you've relied very heavily on China producing parts for uh, various parts, uh, which are essential for manufacturing cars, will bring about effectively a, the supply shock, will bring about a stop in manufacturing for those that are completely reliant on one country for the supplies. And so you'll probably see risk management changing also to looking at dependencies on different countries for a particular product. So competitiveness may actually change from just being a price calculation to also being a risk management cal calculation of diversification of supply sources, which is probably good for globalization. So I think globalization is going to change. I don't think we will see at the end to globalization. I think the world is too linked. The, the capital markets are too linked. The trade uh, environment is too linked, but I think you will see a different pattern of uh, societies and inter-society, cross-country, cross-border uh, relationships. And 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 of course, risk risk mitigation, as you say, um, these these supply shocks. It's all very well when you're assembling um, equipment, etc. When you suddenly realise that you're dependent on that one little part that you just can't get from whichever whichever country has. Um, has come to a halt. You you gave a lecture at Yale at, at, at the end of February, um, and uh, I think it was called around the China versus USA battle for for Africa's future. Um, when you go back and you you think about what you've said, um, what holds true? What doesn't? What do you see this battle shifting um, going forward, or is it just too early to tell? Well, again, I think the political economists around the world are, are pretty much directionally thinking uh, that due to China managing the virus and containing it, no matter who caused it and whether they covered it up, et cetera, et cetera, but the fact that China has effectively managed to contain it in Wuhan and the stories I've heard are absolutely incredible in terms of the amount of organization, the ability to survey, check, monitor and manage that society which has been core to their ability to manage um, the virus by making sure certain amounts of people go to work on certain days, not uh, over densifying areas. Uh, and I could go on for, for a long time, but their ability to manage this virus in the way they have contrasted with the United States uh, who've come at it late, who've come at it in a, in a you know, typical democratic fashion with plurality of views, uh, very slow to get the central state working to bring the National Defense Act to make sure that there's manufacturing of personal protective equipment and masks and respirators and so on and so forth. And, and this, this makes the United States look uh, less impactful in the world than prior to the crisis. Uh, and you probably, you know, you see the rise of China as uh, as, a, a, as a kind of authoritative, credible uh, manager of its own affairs and also 
uh, being you know very quick to offer help to other parts of the world. So it's influence, it's soft power growing in the world. But I would say, you know, the the thesis developed in that paper had two parts. One which uh, is extremely concerning uh, for the world before this crisis, but even more so now, which is the discrepancy between popula share of population and share of gross domestic product in the world. So Africa, prior to the crisis, had 17% of the world's population and 3% of the world's GDP. And the, the, the thesis of, of, the, um, of the lecture was that Africa would effectively have to grow faster than its 5% average growth rate in the last 20 years in order to start to close the gap between GDP share and population share in a rising population growth rate environment where by the end of the century, Africa will have effectively 40% of the world's population because the Western societies are older and they're effectively dying down their population and Africa is a younger society building the population. So if we are to grow at five to 6%, we in 40 years time would still effectively be 12% of the world's GDP and 28% of the then population. So we're not closing the gap, which will cause a huge humanitarian crisis. In this pandemic, with this pandemic, Africa's growth rate is slowing to more like 1% rather than 5%. Yet our, it's not going to slow our population growth. It's, going, it's not going to do much to change the picture of population. So that is going to become a human catastrophe if you've got so many people with so little resources. So that's the one end. On the other hand, uh, the coordination and the strategy of China is undeniable in every respect, in developmental finance, in focus on infrastructure build, focus on military involvement in Africa, focus on strategic involvement in Africa, and the United States, uh, and that will continue through this crisis. And the United States had evolved something called Prosper Africa, which is an attempt to reconfigure and strengthen the United States' involvement in Africa, but has a number of weaknesses and is incomplete in a number of ways. With this crisis, it's very probable that those weaknesses will be shown up and that America is going to look much more inward into solving its problems, given the, the strength of the impact, both in, to, in humanitarian terms and on the economy. And so it's quite unlikely that uh, Prosper Africa will go to its strongest end of the spectrum. It's more likely it'll play to the weakest end of its spectrum. And therefore, China will continue to outstrip the uh, United States, uh, I think, for the foreseeable future, strengthened by this pandemic. It makes it makes sense. You raised two two I think for me very important points in that. The one is the sort of acceleration of the pendulum swing from the U.S. to China in terms of obviously global power and the impact on the continent. The other is of course the deep concern. I mean we saw with Piketty's work um, that post the Second World War it led to a period of relative inequality and already experts are starting to say sorry equality. Experts are starting to say this pandemic is not going to have the same effect. So we're going to see potentially um, inequality get worse and worse, which I think perhaps brings me to, to looking at South Africa. I, I really am keen I to- can't just say, If I can mm, just sure. interrupt you on, one, on that point, and just state the obvious really quickly, which is you know, the, 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 the impact of um, this rising population in Africa and this uh, this very low share of resources is going to not be a, it's not going to be contained to Africa. You're going to have, uh, you know, a, an increasing amount of nationalism, migration, radicalism, militancy in Africa that is going to feed terrorism into the Western world and going to feed, in turn, uh, right wing nationalism in places like Europe and in the United States. So, this is a very unhappy equilibrium. So when the Minister of Finance, Tito Mboweni, and the President, who's chair of the AU, calls for this debt relief on Africa to the tune of $100 billion as a result of this pandemic, the world needs to listen to that and respond. And I believe there is uh, quite a lot of sympathy in the G20 and in the multilateral institutions to this call, because people understand that the consequence of Africa 
uh, independent of this crisis, uh, falling behind is uh, potentially very ghastly into the future. Yeah, playing, playing out in the world. Um, I'm going to switch across to South Africa and Colin, you've already taken us there because we've been shining the spotlight on the continent. Just a note before I move into those questions, I'm going to ask Colin a few questions, but um, we, I am seeing one question from, uh, well, it's a comment from Kutuano. It's just saying his name. So thanks, Kutuano, you've got the ball rolling and I'll come to those questions just now. So um, if you can post other questions, that's going to be my guideline for when I stop asking questions and, and uh, move into the more interesting part for me, which is always hearing from the participants. Um, Colin, uh, you know, briefly, I think it's useful to, to perhaps just reflect on the past couple of weeks. Um, and, and I know that you've been involved in a number of high level discussions uh, around South Africa and what we, what we can do and how with um, the agency that we have, we try and soften the effects of, of the pandemic on the country. I mean, what's your sense right now in terms of where we're standing about how well or not um, South Africa has done in terms of containing the, the pandemic, both from an economic and a public health perspective? Well, on the health side, it, it seems to me that we, we're at the good end of the spectrum uh, on the potential outcomes, uh, but it's too early to say, and it's certainly not a time for complacency. So, you know, South Africans must stay with the course. I, ex I expect personally the lockdown to be extended in one form or another. I don't believe that this is a situation where 21 days can come to an end and life returns to normal. Uh, this is a situation that I think all of us must expect to go on for some time. Uh, but I think that, you know, there is now around about 1600 cases of, of the virus uh, with South Africans at the moment, a low number of deaths. Uh, however tragic those are, there's 11 deaths or so, is probably at the low end of expectations. Uh, but the economic effects are massive. Um, so, and, and I don't see it as a capital problem. This is not a problem of uh, companies being over levered going into the crisis. It's good companies that were well positioned going to the crisis. I'm talking small, medium and large companies that have basically inbuilt co operating costs, employees, rentals and other costs that uh, are ongoing but they have no revenue because they've been forced to close down and that might go on for some time. So effectively what you're gonna have is a liquidity problem. You're gonna have the inability of the banks uh, and the inability of their clients to access liquidity in this period. And therefore those public companies that have shareholders, you're going to see many companies, I think going to the markets to raise capital to see through the period. And you're gonna have increasing stress on the banking system to provide liquidity for clients, but they will not have uh, the depth of ability to do that uh, to the extent that there's, you know, an extensive amount of, uh, of demand on that system. And then you will have a whole lot of small businesses that feel that they can't reopen in a post lockdown environment. Uh, and the first things to go will be you know, attempts to renegotiate rentals. So the property companies are under strain. The second thing to go will be the employees themselves. And, you know, you're going to have a potential rise in the unemployment rate in South Africa. As I say, according to my calculations, if you look at a, you know, negative 4% growth rate in 2020, you're probably going to have a rise in unemployment of somewhere around 10%, which is catastrophic given a 29% standing start. So you may see somewhere between one and two million people in this crisis lose their jobs. So you need to have a fiscal intervention. This is not normal times. You can't bury your head in the sand. This is the time for the authorities to come up with monetary and fiscal interventions. The Saab has responded uh, in the form of dropping interest rates and in the form of relaxing capital rules and buying bonds in the market and basically indicating that they'll provide liquidity. Uh, I think we still to see the national treasury hand, but the national treasury has to come to the party, I think, in terms of providing fiscal intervention or what is classically called mitigation strategies uh, into this crisis. If you look at the countries that have done it, they've done it anywhere between, uh, call it five and 20% of GDP. In the UK's case, it's about 18%. In the United States' case, so far it's 10% of GDP. 
but that 10% is going to rise. So the markets are rallying on the back of an expectation. And the markets are very funny, uh, a very funny entity because you, you expect when unemployment rates are sort of announced to be what they are, that the markets would drop. In fact, they rally on the back of these because their own interpretation of these things is that the, the fiscal stimulus is going to have to increase because the situation is worse than thought. So on fiscal simulation expectations, the markets rally. So in South Africa, what we've seen is the RAND taking a beating. Last time I looked, it was just below 19. Um, but the equity markets, the property companies, the banks, uh, and a variety of other sectors have taken an absolute beating. And it's going to be very important that South Africa provide some kind of fiscal stimulus, probably in the range of 4 to 5% of GDP, even though our fiscal space is highly limited and it will have a negative impact uh, on fiscal deficits, on debt to GDP, on all the ratios that have led us to losing our Moody's investment grade rating. So it's tying in actually with some of the, Colin, what you've been saying is tying in with some of the, the questions. And I'm actually going to turn to, to those questions and I'm going to try and link them to what you've said and then I'll come back. So Charmaine, I'm going to save, um, I'm going to um, tie yours in, which is a, a question of, so can South Africa actually afford a lockdown beyond 21 days? I guess we can't even afford a lockdown of 21 days, but we're going to, we're going to have to. But it ties in with this, this question from um, Umbuyazi where, who says, uh, what conditions would you suggest be placed on African governments should debt relief be done? So I suppose, Colin, what it goes to is there are options. Obviously, one government can go and print more money. That has its own consequences. The second option is to go and look um, for global debt relief, IMF loans, um, et cetera. Um, and, and perhaps that ties into this question. Any, any observations on those two? And, and what is the most affordable, perhaps, in terms of an extended lockdown where it becomes very hard because we're trading um, life and loss of life and health and infections against economic, not even recovery, just trying to keep afloat. Any comments on those? And I'll scroll through and yeah. pick up some more of the questions in the interim. Well, let me just hit one thing on the head. I don't think South Africa can afford the economic costs of a health disaster. So we have to contain the health disaster. So in people's minds, I think it's not a trade-off between either uh, you know, we have the lockdown um, and, um, and suffer the economic consequences, or we don't have the lockdown and don't suffer the economic consequence. If we don't have the lockdown, we'll have a spiraling health crisis, which will be more expensive than the economic lock effects of the lockdown. So I, th I don't think we've got a choice but to do that. The second thing I'd say is there's certain things I don't think we can do as a country. So, for example, there has been talk uh, in some circles of, for example, using foreign reserves of the South African Reserve Bank in this special crisis. I don't think we can do that. I think that, you know, that would cause a huge amount of concerns amongst the market if that was to take place. Uh, you use your, you develop your foreign reserves through hard work over many, many decades. And South Africa has now got to, what, $43 billion of foreign reserves after having a negative position coming into democracy in 1994. So it's taken 25 years to build that up. And it's essential uh, in order to defend the currency, to be able to effectively um, you know, act responsibly. What I do think we have to do is we have to take a certain view. And obviously, that's up to the Minister of Finance, the President, and the Economic Cluster, the Cabinet, to go to meet. Um, this week, you have to take a certain view about needing to make a fiscal intervention to save jobs, to give liquidity to businesses, uh, and, and to increase social grant spending, pay, perhaps through a basic income grant to, to individuals, uh, in such a manner that we protect people from starving, and we protect people from losing jobs, and we help businesses to get through the crisis. There's no good being a bank if you don't have clients. There's no good bringing property owners if you don't have people in the malls and so on. So it's in everyone's interest. This is not just the government. This is in everyone's interest to have this partnership. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. 
There are quite a few questions coming out around uh, what you see as being the impact around different sectors. I'm seeing some with an angle that are around um, the impact on small business. And, and I guess there are two ways of thinking about this. I mean, the, the one is sort of from a macro perspective, who you see being the most affected. Uh, we can come back perhaps at the end to the question about opportunities that come from it. Um, but then also the question about uh, advice. And, and I, I, I see a couple of questions that are coming from particularly um, smaller companies, um, advice to them around how to respond, which may or may not depend on which sector they're in. Any thoughts there? So uh, let me just put it in numbers. So in the eco economic statistics about employment statistics, about of the 16 and a half million, employed today about 7 million are in large companies so obviously those large companies are important to maintain the small companies uh, are around about the same number 6 million 7 million and the medium size a similar number so um, but there's enormous number of small companies employing those people and they have similar problems effectively what you have to think about is six months operating costs why because if you think of the, this as effectively somewhere around a six month crisis that's facing um, businesses, they have to, they have operating costs through that period that as I say are rentals. If you're a restaurant owner uh, or a shopkeeper or you're a petrol um, a service station or whatever, you're paying rentals to your landlord. So you need to negotiate with your landlord. Uh, obviously, the landlords in my, from where I sit are very aware of the problem. Uh, their obvious first response is, no, we don't want to negotiate with you. But they have to because they are not going to have clients at the end of this if yeah, the small no business sector falls over. There's no one left when, when you're done. Over. There's no one left. You know, yeah. there'll be these malls just with no one in them other than the big companies. So there's going to be no one left. And the likes of Edcon, you, you know, are, are suffering. And there are many others. You don't have any revenue who are suffering. So I think rental negotiation is number one. Uh, number two uh, is negotiating the interest payment on your debt because you'll have gone in with debt, your bank. So whoever your bank is, you need to go and see them about rental payment holidays, rent interest reductions, uh, and so on. And I think there are various interventions that, um, that can be considered uh, that are more kind of partnering between the financial sector and the government that could lead to a better solution where you have, you know, six month re interest payment holidays and so on and so forth. But that, you know, nothing has been decided in that connection. So I think the, the reality is, you know, negotiate with your banks on interest payments, negotiate with the landlords on rental payments and payment holidays, perhaps making them whole over an extended period. And then the last thing is obviously employees because people want to get their last. But the reality is you may have seen Woolworths this morning uh, announced that they are, uh, they have negotiated a 30% reduction uh, in employee salaries uh, for the, I think it's the next six month period. I think there'll be a lot more of that. In, in the United States, I heard that GE, for example, is furlonging a lot of the uh, employees, which basically means they are they keep their jobs, but they're not getting income for the period. Now, one wants to avoid that, but it's better than losing your job entirely and becoming unemployed. So it's a very tough situation. I think one has to basically build a cash flow model for six months and work out, you know, over this next six month period, when do you hit a liquidity wall? Be open with your banks, go and negotiate with them. They, in my experience, do not want to lose you as a client. They want to keep as many clients as they can. So, you know, lean in and try and negotiate the best solution you can with your business partners. Right, very, very good advice, Colin. Um, there's um, a the, the, the couple, of, couple of statements I want to come to, but one thought that just struck me as you were talking that I think is going to be really interesting. And that's going to be, uh, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with executive pay. There was an article in the FT today talking about globally um, executives who are, have been quite good at cutting you know, salaries and working to negotiate this, but this is going to be one time where these conversations around the gap between um, 
executive pay and other pay is, is, is really going to come to the fore. It was just a comment. It wasn't a statement from everybody. Mm -hmm. There's quite a lot of comments. Um, and again, I, I'm not going to be able to get to everyone, but I'm trying to sort of go through particularly the business comments. Um, there's quite a lot of comments about the role that the banks will play. And obviously we've spoken about the Reserve Bank, but um, generally a, a, a couple of comments here. You've spoken about it coming another way, which is to go out and negotiate terms with banks, what's the role that you see for the South African banking sector playing either as individuals or collectively? Yeah, I, I, can I just say something before that? I, um, I informed the Solidarity Fund last night that I'm going to give them uh, 650,000 rand as a contribution to the Solidarity Fund. And the reason I, I, I'm doing that is because I think the contribution by you know people who are getting bonuses and things like that you know people really need to look at themselves and say however difficult things are uh, for any individual um, you know this is a time to think about people that really don't have anything and you know th something like the solidarity fund you know has a valuable role to play in getting personal you know protection equipment and buying, as far as I understand it, from A.D. Entoven, the chairman, the vice chairman of the fund, buying respirators and, and those sorts of things for a coming crisis in the healthcare environment. I would just encourage people to think of uh, giving to the Solidarity Fund. I'm just sharing that information uh, with you as, as one example uh, of what can be done. And I find, you know, this is not the time for companies to be announcing uh, what they've paid the CEOs large salaries or uh, making exotic purchases uh, or anything like that. That will really anger, you know, people in the, in the world at large. And uh, so I think restraint and generosity are the two things one would look for from large companies at this point in time. On the question of what the banks can do, I think there's a lot that the banks can and must and should do. And frankly, need to do and they need to do it in their vested interest uh, i'm talking the commercial large yeah. commercial banks it's very important that they protect their customers through this period and as we've just discussed um it's important that they partner because the banks will have a uh, a certain capacity from a lending point of view and that capacity is inevitably going to be too little relative to the demand at this point so I think it's important to think about things like have been announced in other countries. I don't know if you saw in Switzerland, they announced a guarantee fund uh, where effectively banks are combining uh, capital and then the, the government is providing a back-to-back -back guarantee and that releases leverage for banks to, to, um, to lend into the environment to small, medium and large businesses and provide liquidity into the system. It's been done in the United Kingdom. There's been a variety of ways in which banks have been facilitated. And the Reserve Bank has been important in effectively taking the top layer of the buffer of capital and allowing that top layer of capital to be utilized, one or 2% of the capital requirements to be effectively forgiven in this period and to be used for lending. So that, that creates across the banking system a significant amount of uh, capital that can go into leveraged loans effectively to businesses. And this is essential to provide liquidity at this time. Useful input. Um, I'm going to encourage people who feel that their questions haven't been answered to also look at some of the comments that are coming through on the webinar chat because there's quite a few people addressing. Um, Colin, I'm going to move to, to a close. I want to, I want to try and end with the, the silver lining on a very, very dark cloud. Um, and ask you um, where you see the opportunities in this at the moment. And it might be, I mean, we've spoke, I think you mentioned actually a couple of weeks ago going, who is this company called Zoom? And I wonder if I should try and buy shares in them. But um, it goes beyond the obvious of the, of the portals and the technology that's, that's coming out. But um, I think for, for all uh, businesses themselves to, to be trying to look for the opportunities, as well as potentially opportunities across certain sectors. Um, I, I'm not going to be so brash as to say there might be winners in this, um, but where do you, and what's your advice for people who are saying, look, you know, how do I try and use a very negative situation mm -hmm. for the positive? 
Look, there are winners in this. I mean, that's the, the horrible situation. It's not that they wanted to be winners, but they've positioned themselves to be winners. Amazon is the most obvious case. You know, the living in the New York for the first two months of the year before I came back to Johannesburg and I'm now in lockdown and I don't think I'll get back to New York until August. Now I'm on Zoom all the time and so on and so forth and running my Yale course from, from Zoom. You know, I'm learning Zoom. When I moved to New York, I learned what it was like to effectively live basically alone uh, and use the online platforms. The online platforms to buy anything, uh, you know, ironically, are a U.S. technology company provided like Amazon, online purchasing and delivery and logistics. And when you get the product, they're mostly made in China. So, the, you, you know, you, whatever you buy for the home, you know, 80% of the product is made in China. So it's, it's a sort of fascinating situation, but I think that that is, you know, today I think Amazon has 150,000 unfilled posts that they're advertising for, for employment um, right now. Zoom's share price has gone up many fold. Um, the, you know, there are gonna be winners, but I think what's gonna happen to be, to be frank is some of these trends that are taking place are irreversible. And they're technology trends in the main, technology facilitated trends. And I, I would just share this one um, picture with you, with the audience is in 1996, I was a World Economic Forum global, global leader for tomorrow. That, that was a long time ago. So I'm no longer global leader for tomorrow. Um, anyway, um, there was a panel with Bill Gates, Sony, uh, Sony CEO, Ide, uh, Larry Ellison, uh, and one other I can't remember, where they were basically talking about the internet. And they were saying in 1996, the internet was going to have a dramatic impact on people's lives. And they said they don't know what platform that is going to be, but it's going to have dramatic people way on which, on lifestyles, on consumer, the way people consume things and so on. And now 25, 30 years later, we can see the mobile phone is that device. We can see all of the consumer revolution basically the disruption that has taken place now i would say think about what's going to happen in the next 25 years i think in 25 years the way public service is delivered health online education online passports online um you know immigration services online tax online i don't think we're ever going to go to a government office i think government services are going to become an online behavioral uh, area so we're going to have a situation where public service is going to effectively go to a nucleus and you're going to have a dramatic fall in the number of public servants, in my humble opinion, throughout the world, and it will inevitably hit South Africa. But what we've seen through this is people staying at home, working online. We've seen education uh, being provided online. Health, we're learning online. So my daughter had... Uh, the coronavirus in London. She's an opera singer. She was very sick for four days. She's fully recovered now. Uh, but she phoned into, I got her to phone into the UK health system, the NHS, and she was answered by a robot. The robot basically asked her a number of questions, the end of which they said, wait for somebody to help you uh, because you clearly have an issue. The person answered and said to her, are you well enough to stay at home? or do you have to go to hospital? So she said, I'm well enough to stay at home. They said, good, if your, if your situation uh, deteriorates, we don't do testing, if your situation deteriorates, uh, you must get your husband to bring you to hospital. So that was effectively a technological way of treating her. Uh, and I'm sure that people are, many thousands, millions of people are gonna be treated for this virus online or on the phone. And this is going to change the way in which health, education, public service uh, is going to be delivered. And I think it's going to accelerate uh, the revolution and the disruption in technology in ways that we haven't uh, anticipated. I mean, I love being at home. I don't, I don't necessarily uh, want to go to work every day. I don't want to have to go to Yale every day when I'm back there. Maybe I'll do my Zoom education online when everything is fine. Um, in, in, in Yale in the future. So I, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but I think this situation is going to change people's behaviors quite, quite fundamentally. 
Colin, I want to, first of all, really thank, thank you for your insightful comments, for coming on, for being the, the, um, the, the founding panelist on our, on our flash forums. Um, you know, my, my sadness is it's at this point, usually in our forums where I say to everybody, and now we'll take the conversation on outside over some drinks and some snacks, and we can't, um, that's the one disadvantage is we can't commune um, around the food. I think you've given us some really sobering reflections. You've also um, alluded to how the world is going to change. And I guess um, in, in closing from my side, at Gibbs, one of the things that I observe is there is just no space for Luddites. So previously where we've said those clever IT people will come with a solution, I think we're seeing people on the steepest possible learning curve that they can, they can be on. But one of the incredible things around this time is that there's just no space for any embarrassment that you, you don't know. Um, none of us know. We don't know exactly what's going to be. So it's a time where I think we've got to be learning really fast, where for those of us um, that have an awful lot to learn, um, I know I'm reaching out to my kids in lockdown. They are, they are my chief learning officers right now in terms of a whole lot of things. I mean, I'm very grateful that we have the technology and that we have the Zooms. But the question, I suppose, is for each of us to find our own internal resilience and then to start thinking about our organizations and the role that we can play in the country and whether that's about giving back in the form of skills, whether that's about donations to the fund and the solidarity fund, um, whether that's about re reaching out to people and reassuring them and using the technology that we have. Um, from my side, it's just to say a, a big thanks to you, Colin, a very big thank you to everybody who signed in today via Zoom and that's also been listening um, uh, in our YouTube uh, broadcast. Uh, we wish you well, and uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing some of you. I'm not hosting tomorrow, but we'll be having the next Flash Forum at two o'clock tomorrow. Colin, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I think that's a wrap for today. Thank you very much, Nicola.